Okay, well, it's noon, so we're going to get started. I want to thank everybody for joining us and welcome to the NDSU Extension Agriculture Challenges webinar. Um, unfortunately, we, we had the need to host this webinar series. Um, I'm not going to dwell on the issues, and all of you are aware of the challenges facing agriculture producers this, this year. Um, specifically, this topic was chosen. Um, with reports that we've gotten in our county offices that the percentages of wheat harvest and is variable. Some places was 100%, but some areas it's 60% is still remaining in the fields. Um, and then those that were lucky enough to get it harvested are running into lots of issues with quality um, and having their wheat rejected at the elevators. So, we're getting lots of questions. What what are the options available to producers for this wheat? Um, so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Just a couple housekeeping items before we get started. If you are not speaking, please mute your line um, so we don't get any feedback. We are going to be holding all our questions until the end of the webinar. Um, and you have the option that you can either ask them live or you can put them in the chat box and we'll be monitoring the chat box so that you don't get forgotten about if you do type your question in instead of instead of asking it live. Again, these will be recorded and posted on the NDSU Extension Livestock Management webpage, and I will show you where to find that when we wrap up. So I'm going to kick this off so we can get started and have lots of time for questions. Our first speaker is going to be Joel Ransom, and he is going to talk about the agronomic concerns and options for for unharvested wheat. And he's the Extension Agronomist here in Fargo. Good afternoon. Uh, though I practiced this, I need to uh, do it again, I guess. Okay, there we go. Everybody hear me okay? And uh, PowerPoint's up okay? Yes, everything looks good. All right, so I've been asked to speak about the agronomic concerns associated with unharvested wheat. And, and of course, uh, as was already mentioned, we've really had a tough year. And uh, we're probably even more concerned about uh, if we think um, in the state as a whole, it's probably also wheat that has not uh, met the standard for milling grade. So in the last week's crop and pet, our crop progress report, it indic or indicated 5% of spring wheat in the state was still in the field and harvested 9% of the Durham. This week, uh, there was no report of spring wheat still in the field, but I, I'm assuming that that's simply because the question wasn't asked and that 6% uh, was still remain. So I think it does suggest that there's still a fair amount of wheat unharvested. But even with that, I think uh, not just the, har the wheat that's in the field, but there's uh, also many uh, bushels of, of wheat that were harvested late or that were rained on prior to harvest that will probably not meet standards for milling grade. Uh, due to this uh, weather-related damage. So let me just talk about uh, what kind of damage that uh, we see and how that uh, um, affects the, the, the value of the crop and, and what one can do with it. I think there are, uh, first of all, low falling numbers. Uh, the second would be uh, grain that got rained on is likely to have some sprouted kernels. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about high levels of dawn, which are associated with fuse air and head blight. So let me just talk first about the grading levels uh, that uh, where price uh, discounts come into effect. So falling numbers, anything below 300 usually uh, is considered, uh, may, may get a discount. And the amount of discount, um, may vary by location. And 
uh, so I think I've heard uh, something like a penny a, a, a second is a potential discount below uh, 300. But again, I, I would think that might vary depending on uh, the area where you're at. As far as damaged kernels are concerned or sprouted kernels, kernels um, more than 4% damaged kernels, including sprouted kernels, cause grain to be related grade three or lower and typically is unacceptable for bread making and discounts will certainly come into effect. And then the dawn levels, uh, we have a advisory level of one part per million in uh, food. Uh, so typically discounts begin at either one or two parts per million. Um, generally they can uh, mill out about uh, one part per million or about half of the dawn levels. And so sometimes uh, discounts don't begin until they're a bit higher than the one part per million that's deemed uh, safe for human consumption. So what are the causes of low falling numbers? And most typically it's associated with grain being wetted after it's reached harvest moisture. Enzymes are produced that degrade the starch and that makes uh, bread making somewhat difficult. You can have low falling numbers without vis visible germinated kernels. And I think that there have been some growers that have been uh, concerned about that, that they actually have very sound kernels going in, but have low falling numbers and are subject to some discount. I think it's fair to say that if you have sprout visible sprouted kernels, you're always going to have low falling numbers. Now, um, what about what are the causes of pre-harvest germination where you actually see some sprouts and of course it's associated with high humidity and rainfall and it, it usually happens after the kernels have passed through a period of after ripening and so your kernels have actually had to dry down to a point of a, let's say about 20 to 25 percent moisture and then be re-wetted. Um, there is some sensitivity or difference in uh, sprouting ability of uh, varieties. Um, uh, we at NDSU don't uh, do any screening for this at the moment, but there are some really very reliable numbers coming out of U of M. But I think if you look at our list of varieties, you'll see that most are fairly resistant to pre-harvest sprouting. So, we can still have sprouting even with some kind of high levels of resistance if we have the right conditions. What do we do with the sprout damaged grain? I think that's the question that uh, is on everyone's mind. I think animal feed, uh, it's very, I think most of the data would suggest that the feed value is, is, is very high, even though you may have some sprout. I think the main issue with being able to sell it for milling is because of its dough functionality. You could also consider using the seed the following season, but you want to want to check and recheck germination. Um, I think most of the data would suggest that, that sprouted kernels can be effective for uh, seed, being used for seed, but I would certainly um, check germination in the spring if the intent was to do that because we may lose some condition. These are, these are kernels that are more likely to, to be um, uh, lose condition. And if you see sprouted uh, seedling parts on the sprouted seed, these will, should also be avoided, any seed lots with that. High levels of dawn are associated with the fusarium fungus. As I mentioned earlier, uh, wheat is most sensitive to scab during flowering. So it's very possible that we could have seed lots that have sprouted and low falling numbers where we did not have significant levels of dawn. Um, and it would be vice versa. You may have seed lots that are high, high levels of dawn that uh, had no problem with uh, low falling numbers or scabbing kernels. Um, I would, before using uh, Wheat for animal feed, I would certainly have it tested for dawn levels so you know what you're dealing with. Uh, you can have sound kernels that have high levels of dawn. And you can have, and if you have scabby looking kernels, you're definitely gonna have high levels of dawn. So, I mean, that's a, a red flag if you have scabby kernels, uh, but I would still have sound kernels also tested for dawn. 
Okay, so using grain uh, that has, or wheat that has high levels of Don, you could graze the field, and I think there'll be others that will be talking briefly about that. Uh, you could plane aggressively and try to reduce the Don to a, a reasonable level that might be marketable. Um, certainly feed uh, the harvested grain, uh, but there are prescribed limits on the amount of Don that can be fed, and I think other speakers will be addressing that. And again, you can use the seed the following year. I think if uh, the seed lot is cleaned well, has good germination, there is uh, good data to support that it'll uh, function quite well as a uh, for seed. So I think that's uh, what I wanted to cover. For those of you who have joined us late, um, while the next speaker is getting load, their slides loaded, I just want to remind you that if you haven't, please make sure that you're muted. I think everybody has been doing a great job of that. And then also we'll be holding the questions to the end. If you're worried you're going to forget your question, you can type it in the chat box and we will address that at the end. So our next speaker is Jana Block. She is a livestock systems specialist at the Hedinger Research Extension Center, and she is going to be talking about livestock nutrition when feeding standing wheat. All right, can you see and hear me? Everything good? Okay. All right, so this is definitely um, a unique situation and unique challenges this year. So it's kind of a what we know versus what we don't scenario. I think we know fairly well how to graze winter wheat and then harvest a grain crop. I think we know how to harvest grain and then graze standing stubble. Um, these are a couple pictures I'll share with you from here at the Research Center in Hedinger. I think what we don't know is what to do when we have standing grain that um, is facing some challenging conditions that we talked about such as snow or standing water. And then this is uh, some mature wheat that was harvested as hay and is now sprouting in the haystack. So today we're going to try to provide you with some general recommendations, um, but we understand that there's most likely a lot of unique scenarios out there that may require some individual follow-up. So please don't hesitate to do that. So what we know about feeding wheat, um, either in grain or hay. Um, so wheat grain is very high quality and very palatable has a higher crude protein content than most of our small grains and an energy value similar to that of corn. It's very low in fiber and high in starch and the starch is fermented very quickly in the rumen and so that can lead to a lot of digestive disorders such as the ones listed here um, and can also have caused some erratic feeding behavior, um, cattle going off and on feed um, with different digestive problems. So we put up a lot of wheat hay in North Dakota, especially during a drought year when it looks like it's not going to make grain. Um, but ideally, we would know that ahead of time and harvest that before the dough stage to get the best quality. So at this point, we're probably dealing with more of a grain plus straw mixture. Um, obviously, everything is fairly mature. Um, and then there's also fair physical characteristics such as ons and the hard texture of the straw that can impact palatability and the ability of those animals to um, actually physically eat um, the grain, the standing grain. So it's going to be extremely variable in terms of what the cattle are going to eat and also the quality that is available to them. So in terms of recommendations for feeding wheat, um, we definitely have some upper limits on how much you can use in the diet, depending on whether you're looking at a high grain ration or more of a supplement for a mature beef cow type ration that's based on forage. So we always talk about avoiding self-feeding, which in a lot of situations, if we're talking about grazing standing wheat, it's definitely going to be a self-feeding situation. And so it's important to consider uh, techniques such as strip grazing or some way of uh, reducing the amount available to the animals. Regardless, uh, slow adaptation is going to be critical. Um, if you're thinking about grazing standing wheat, it's best to get those animals started on some type of grain. Wheat would be best um, at a pound or two a day and then gradually working them up. And um, we'll talk about some other adaptation things um, prior to grazing as well. It's important to make sure that you're providing high levels of roughage 
So it would be a good idea to um, provide free choice hay out on pasture if possible. Um, might also consider um, providing buffers such as limestone or sodium bicarb, which is just essentially baking soda, um, and or ionophores to try to kind of limit some of those digestive disturbances. So obviously grazing standing grain versus feeding wheat grain changes the feeding situation. Uh, researchers in Australia reported that digestibility was decreased by over 25% when they fed whole wheat, which had a seed coat, versus um, rolled wheat that did not. So this may help reduce the risk of digestive disorders, but we honestly can't say for sure um, based on individual, individual situations. So you're gonna need to know how much grain is available, and I believe Miranda is going to talk about that later in this presentation. Also should consider um, collecting a representative sample of the fields that you plan to graze and submitting that to the lab for analysis so that you know what type of nutrients you're supplying. Um, Joel mentioned sprouted grain. He's correct. There's really no differences in sprouted grain versus undamaged grain in terms of feeding value. Um, we do know that a great deal of starch is used up in the plant to produce a seedling, and so this, again, may help reduce the risk of acidosis, but we can't say for sure that it's completely eliminated. And the other challenge is dealing with the increased risk of mold, mycotoxins, ergot, and other, um, you know, potential contaminants that you might have in the field. So we really have to, you know, this is a, a lot of what if situations. All we can do is apply what we know to the, comp to the situation and use our common sense. Um, don't turn hungry cows out on wheat pasture. If you're going to be using wheat pasture for a significant amount of time, you're gonna to wanna to provide a mineral supplement. Um, wheat straw and wheat grain are both low in calcium. Um, they're also deficient in some trace minerals such as zinc. And so, especially for pregnant cows, those are going to be important to provide. Um, again, the buffers and ionophores, if those are necessary, depending on how much grain is out there, and that can be incorporated into your mineral supplement, no problem. I think, uh, again, just because of the individual nature of these situations, your observation and keeping an eye on things is going to be really important, um, making necessary adjustments to maintain cow condition and health. And I would really urge you not to hesitate to call on us. Um, the county agents are available to come out and check out your situation. They can consult with specialists to help you um, figure out you know, the best management practices for your situation. So that's all I have. Thank you, Jana. Um, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Gerald Stucka, and he is gonna talk about livestock health considerations when grazing standing wheat. Thank you, Jan, or thank you, Miranda. Trying to bring up my... Uh, There we go, bring it up, there we go. Does this come up for everyone? I'm assuming it does. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for letting us share this information with you. And actually, Jan and I are gonna overlap quite a bit here, but I do wanna mention this as we start. There is a lot of unharvested feed, and we're gonna talk about this later in the week as well and focus on specific crops. But I want you to think about, about the fact that those of you that have beef cows have a wonderful resource to harvest things that can't be harvested. So I want you to work. What we're trying to do here is manage the flexibility of that beef cow without causing problems or health risks in her, in her life. So I've got a picture there of unharvested corn that's actually silage corn that hasn't been put up, soybeans that are down and on the one on the one on the right is a harvested wheat field, but actually there's regrowth coming out there, and so there's always something for that cow to eat uh, during the after the grazing season, which is where we are right now. Jana mentioned this earlier. The risk of grazing wheat is the fact that we can take in too much carbohydrates or starch in too uh, um, a short of a time, where you whereby you get rapid fermentation, and Jana, men Jana mentioned that as well because uh, wheat is a highly soluble starch and it will ferment pretty rapidly. The hard seed coat does protect it a little bit, but it gets wet inside the room and then fermentation begins. So what results in too much acid production, which is a condition we call acidosis, the cattle act like they're drunk, 
their manure becomes loose, loose. In some cases, if you really examine manure closely, it'll have a little bubbles in it, and, and that's pretty good evidence that you got acidosis going on. This, some of the sweet sequels that can happen with acidosis, you might end up with respiratory disease in calves. You may actually induce abortions in pregnant cows if they've had enough and the acidosis is severe enough. The other thing I'll mention about grazing wheat. Now, this is not just finding piles of wheat. This is actually grazing wheat. If the cattle are going to consume the, the plant, the stalk, and everything that's there, and remember the only thing that's really valuable, in essence, is the grain itself. But they might try and consume a number of heads, and there's beards in those heads. And it makes that mouth, that soft tissue in the mouth, susceptible to penetration by those beards. And you can end up with mouth abscesses and even perhaps even uh, a condition that we call lump jaw. This is a little bit related to what Jana was talking about. This is a, uh, one of our NDSU publications where they talked about supplemental use as, of wheat for beef cows that should be kept under five to six pounds. And my question is this, and I think I've, it'll be my opinion, can a cow harvest 10 to 15 pounds of grain from un unharvested wheat? She's actually gonna have a difficult time to do this, but I'm not saying it can't happen. So there's the risk, there's a risk there. It'd be different if there was piles of wheat in the field, that's high risk. The fact that she's gotta eat the, the head, the, the hulls, the beards and everything to get this wheat makes it a little bit less, quite a bit less likely that this is actually gonna happen. But nevertheless, there's some risk there. So just a couple other tips, and this is exactly what Jana was talking about. Never turn out cattle that are hungry into something that they haven't consumed before. So that's just a, a rule of thumb that, that applies. And, and also provide other feed available to these cows when they're out on unharvested wheat. I would suggest, at least on wheat, maybe better to separate calves, wean those calves before you put them out there. They may actually be more susceptible to those bearded wheats and the possibilities of developing abscess. And finally, just examine wheat for the evidence of ergot bodies. And Joel mentioned, you know, vomitoxin. You know, cows don't really care about vomitoxin. They have a pretty high tolerance for it. Humans don't, monogastrics don't. They don't care if it's sprouted. They don't care about falling numbers, they'll eat it. But the one that we wanna be concerned with is these ergot bodies. And they're those black little bodies and they don't have to eat very much. It's been estimated maybe one in a thousand. Yeah, if there's more than one in a thousand along with the kernels, then you might have a problem. Though, so this is an image of ergot bodies on a stalk of wheat. Anyway, thanks for letting us share the information. My contact information is here as well. And so thank you very much. And we can take questions, I guess, at the end. So I'm your next speaker. I'm Miranda Meehan. I'm the Livestock Environmental Stewardship Specialist here at NDSU in Fargo. And I'm gonna be talking about grazing management within standing wheat, which both, both Jana and Jerry did touch on those. So as Jana said, um, strip grazing is probably your best option when you're grazing standing wheat. The reason for this is that this is gonna limit your grain intake and reduce the risk of health issues. Um, we recommend that that is limited to no more than three days, ideally one to two, um, especially when you're starting out, you wanna start slow um, and, and let those cows get adjusted to grazing, grazing that standing wheat. Um, so those of you that aren't familiar with strip grazing, um, and we do get some complaints when we, we propose this, is it, it, it's some work. Um, but in this situation, it's pretty important so we don't run into those health issues. Um, so strip grazing is you're gonna section off the field and allow them to only have so many days worth of feed or forage to graze. Um, and what you'll do is you'll start at one end, or the easiest way to do it, um, you can section off ahead of time and just let them through 
Um, but one of the simplest ways is just to move the fence as they as they complete an area to the and allow, allow them access to another area of the same size. Um, one of the limitations we have when using this system is water availability, water access. So starting at the end closest to where you can access water, whether that's letting them through pastures to an existing water source, or if you're hauling water and just have one designated location that you're hauling to. Um, and then they can walk across back across the areas that they've already grazed to access that water. So that'll make it a little less work on your end. So as a grazing management special or specialist or expert, we, we get stuck with the fun part, all the math. Um, so if you have questions about this, contact your extension agent, um, contact myself or Kevin Sedevic, and we can help step you through this. So to estimate the acres per day that you should be grazing for your herd, um, the first step we're gonna estimate the wheat yield. Um, so to first we'll calculate this in bushels per acre. Um, to do this, you're gonna count the number of spikes in an area or three foot row length. Um, and so if you see the image over here, the spike is the seed head. And you want to, you don't, you don't want to count ones that aren't, you want to do the average ones. You don't want to, don't count the ones that are really small and not producing much of anything. Um, then next, you're going to take six spikelets that are representative of that, of that row and count the number of spikes on that or count the number of spikelets on that spike. And so spikelet um, is, you see that the little, the littler image to the right of the seed head shows you what a spikelet is. Um, and then you're gonna count or estimate the number of kernels per spikelet. Um, you can do this by threshing. Our, um, a good estimate is if you have a normal yield, it's 2.3 kernels and in a stress scenario, which many of you may be in, um, is 2.1 kernels per spikelet. And then you're gonna take this times 0 0.142, which is the average weight per kernel. You'll divide this all by your row spacing in inches, and this will give you bushels per acre. Once you've completed that calculation, you're gonna take this times 60, which is the average pounds in bushel of wheat. Then we're gonna compare the, our, our yield to our recommended intake. Um, and both Jan and Jerry talked about these numbers. Uh, for hard wheats, it's five to six pounds per head per day. And for Durham, it's 3.5 to 4.5 pound, pounds per head per day. So you're gonna take, for your, to calculate the intake for your cows, you're gonna take the number of cows you're grazing times the desired intake and that'll give you the recommended. And then you're gonna compare that to your estimated wheat yield. So the next step then to figure out how many acres they should be accessing per day for your herd, um, you're going to take that recommended intake number that we just calculated and divide it by the wheat yield in pounds per acre. And that'll give you the number of acres that that your herd needs to graze per day. And if you're allocating them more than one day at a time, you'll just multiply by the two or three to get the number, the area needed to, to support your cows or your herd for that period of time. Some considerations when we are grazing standing wheat. Um, as both Jan and Jerry said, do not let turn out hungry cows. Make sure that they have some type of roughage in them so that they're not gorging themselves on a, a feed that they're not adjusted to and give them some time to adjust. Also, we want to look at the condition of that wheat. Is there sprout da damage? Um, how much available grain is there? Because that's going to impact our health um, risks. Another thing that we need to consider is if when and if and when if what herbicides were applied to this wheat 
and what are the label restrictions for grazing because um, that can really impact come back to impact you when you go to sell those those cattle um, with grazing it, this is a constant concern when we're grazing cropland for producers um, and it's it's going to be a big issue in our saturated soils so the potential for compaction if we are grazing if we're going to be grazing this, we need to wait until the ground's frozen or dried out. So for most of you, we're going to be waiting until the ground's frozen to reduce that hoof impact and reduce the potential for compaction on, the, on that acreage. Um, just a reminder, as Jana said, this isn't something that we normally do. So these are just rec what we're making our recommendations based on the best available science but there isn't any science specifically looking at grazing standing wheat. Um, so this is our best, our best judgment call and recommendations based on available science. Um, so that's what I have for grazing. Um, unfortunately, Brian Parman, who is gonna be talking about the economics and insurance considerations, is traveling the state um, speaking at our egg lenders conference that our egg economist put on every year. And so he's unable to join us today. Um, I spoke with him this morning and these are the main things that he wants you to be thinking about and considering. Um, and, and if you have any other questions, just feel free to reach out and contact him or, or your local county agent. So number one is contact your insurance agent, discuss your scenario, um, discuss the options available to you before you make any decisions. Um, also contact your local, local FSA office um, to get a better understanding of what programs you're eligible for in your county and what restrictions there are on those programs. Most of these programs are gonna require appraisal to calculate payments. So make sure that's done before you make any decisions to harvest or graze. Insurance period for our small grains, wheats and barley is this week and October 31st. So if you are going to use these crops for something other than their intended use, you need to wait until after this date or you might not be eligible to receive your full insurance payment. So with that, I am gonna we'll wrap things up here and we'll open up for questions. Miranda, there is one in the chat pod. Let's see. So there is a question for Joel. It's, I got a call from a farmer in Montana this morning about we, he was wonder he was wondering if he could use for seed in 2020. Um, so MSU lab germ test was 96%. Private lab tested sample for sprouting and falling numbers came in at 12% sprout and low 103 FN. Grain is in a bin with air and he's confident it is dry and he can keep it stored well over winter. We discussed how sprout doesn't automatically mean low germ and I recommended he send a sample for germ tests in late February, early March, and see, and if it is still good, then go ahead and use a seed and just rate up a few percentage if needed to compensate for germ. Any additional thoughts? Um, Joel? Yeah, so I, I, I responded to her that I totally agreed with her recommendation. So uh, there's a pretty good set of data out there to suggest that, uh, you know, seed lots with low falling numbers or even some level of uh, germ, uh, germ damage will serve as good seed lots in, in the next season, but it would really depend on the germination. So in this case, where germination is coming in at 96, you can have pretty good confidence that it's gonna be a good seed lot. And then uh, as she as Claire recommended, that uh, the real key would be to make sure you do another germ test in the spring because uh, these seed lots are likely to lose condition much faster than others. Now, we have pretty cold winters, so maybe things will be held uh, pretty nicely over the winter, but uh, I would certainly recommend another um, 
germ test in the spring. And if it's not an organic situation, I, I, I think you probably would benefit from having some seed treatment too, just as, a, as another uh, insurance, so to speak, that the seed lot will do well. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Joel. This is Claire. Um, I was just wondering, any thoughts on that sprout percentage? I mean, understanding that high sprout doesn't necessarily mean an unviable seed. I, I was, it just got me thinking about, you know, is 30% sprout when you'd start getting nervous or just ignore that and go on a germ test, you know, shortly before planting? Uh, my recommendation would be to probably ignore it unless that there are visible seedling parts extruded from the seed already because they'll often as you go through the seeding process get knocked and and broken and, and it will result in a, a non-viable seed seedling so that would be the other part you know so if you had 11 percent germ uh, and they're you know the way they grade it is is you can just barely see a, a sprout coming out um, I wouldn't be overly concerned with that but if you actually have um, you know sprout parts that are likely to be damaged in the seeding process then I'd be more concerned and you know you'd adjust accordingly if if you still decide to use it okay thank you Do we have any other questions? While you're, get, I'll give you some time to think about questions. Oh, questions for me. Um, did you record these presentations? Yes, we are recording these presentations. That's actually just what I was going to share with you guys. So, all of our webinars are going to be recorded. So, if you're wanting to make another one and aren't able to join us, we are recording them and we will be posting them on the NDSU Extension Livestock Management page. On this, It's this page here. And so you will be able to access all of them there. Another thing, if you have a question for one of us that you don't want to answer at this time, if you go to this page and you go to the Connect, you'll find contact information for all of our livestock specialists that are going to be speaking as part of our webinar series. Um, Joel is not on here. He's over in crops on our crops team and so you could find his contact information there or just get a hold of me and or one of us and we can get that to you also.